Peace be upon you. In the Quran, God informs us that he created everything in pairs. In Surah 43, verse 12, it reads, He is the one who created all kinds in pairs, and he created for you ships and livestock to ride. By creating things in pairs, it allows us to compare and contrast two similar events or scenarios. And by understanding the differences between these two, can you get at the root of what it is that you're studying? One of the research fields that's very popular is twin studies. And the ideal scenario is to find two identical twins who are separated at birth and then come and study them when they're adults to see how much of their upbringing was dictated by their biology versus how much of their upbringing was dictated by their surroundings. And this is the classic nature versus nurture debate. By having these two pairs and seeing how they differ and how they're the same, can you truly understand the subject that you're studying? And this is a mechanism that God utilizes throughout the Quran by giving us these contrasting pairs. In Surah 35, verse 19 through 22, it reads, The blind and the seer are not equal, nor are the darkness and the light, nor are the coolness of the shade and the heat of the sun, nor are the living and the dead. God causes whomever he wills to hear. You cannot make hearers out of those in the graves. By understanding the blind, do we understand what it means to see? And similarly, by understanding darkness, do you get to appreciate and understand light? And by having these opposing pairs, these contrasting elements, do you get to understand the opposite? And this is a mechanism that God utilizes in the Quran for us to learn from. In Surah 39, verse 23, it reads, God has revealed herein the best hadith, a book that is consistent and points out both ways. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the Arabic for this expression of consistent and pointing out both ways, the Arabic is muttashabi'an, which means uh, it's similar or contrasting or comparing, and mathani, which means pairs. So in essence, God is telling us that God has revealed the best hadith, a book that is of comparing pairs or contrasting pairs. And this shows us the difference between those who basically make it to heaven and those who are going to make it to hell. And it's by understanding these contrasting scenarios, these pairs, can we understand the true substance of what it is that we're studying. Have you ever seen these optical illusions where they have a dot on two different backgrounds? So one background is going to be totally light and bright, and it makes the dot seem so dark, so gloom. And then you take the other dot on a dark background, and now that dot looks like it's radiating. The brightness of it has just been illuminated. And what's fascinating is that these two dots are the same color. And the only thing that's changed was the background color. And by having a different background color, where in one scenario, it's blazing white, and in another scenario, it's dark black. Can you really understand that object that you're studying? You're able to see the darkness and the light by seeing this contrast and simply by superimposing it on different colored backgrounds. It becomes that much more vivid what it is that we're studying. Because if you put that dot on a very gray-scaled background, it becomes almost impossible to distinguish its edges, to be able to understand what is it that we're truly supposed to learn. And what I want to do in this episode is look at some of these examples in the Quran, these contrasting pairs, and what we can learn from them. Because oftentimes these subtleties can be lost, but by superimposing them in the right light or in the right context of darkness, does it really become apparent these lessons we're supposed to learn? And this first example is with Pharaoh, probably one of the most wicked individuals who ever lived on this planet. And when God sent Moses and Aaron to present to Pharaoh these proofs of God and to try to correct Pharaoh's tyrannical ways, what was Pharaoh's response? 
In Surah 40, verse 36, it read, Pharaoh said, O Haman, this is Pharaoh's chief architect, it says, Build for me a high tower that I may reach out and discover. I want to reach the heaven and take a look at the God of Moses. I believe he is a liar. Thus were the evil works of Pharaoh adorned in his eyes, and thus was he kept from following the right path. Pharaoh's scheming was truly evil. Now think about what Pharaoh is claiming in this command to Haman. Pharaoh wants to build a tower in order to tower over God. He is attempting to elevate his status in this world and belittle God, Lord of the universe, that he's going to look at the God of Moses. Now, what a wicked individual. Now, what I want to emphasize is this aspect of build. In Arabic, it's ibni. This word is used by Pharaoh in this command, but it's also used by Pharaoh's wife. In Surah 66, verse 11, it reads, And God cites as an example of those who believed the wife of Pharaoh. She said, My Lord, build Ibni, a home for me at you in paradise, and save me from Pharaoh and his works. Save me from the transgressing people. You have two individuals who happen to be pairs, their husband and wife. One of them, is using his power, his authority, to try to belittle God and elevate his status. While the other one is using this prayer to God to abolish the vanities of this world in favor to have a place near God in the hereafter. Both of them are requesting for someone to build for them, but one is doing it for the sake of of going towards hell, to destroying their own soul, while the other one is doing it to build up credit, to reserve a spot for them next to God in the hereafter. And it's by studying these two pairs, these two individuals, these spouses, are we able to understand what it is that we want in this world? Is our purpose in this world to draw closer to God so we can have a place next to God in the hereafter? Or is our purpose in this world to build up our own vanity, build up our own exaltation, to have great things strictly in this world and forsake our souls in the hereafter? In Surah 35 verse 10, it reads, Anyone seeking dignity should know that to God belongs all dignity. To Him ascends the good words and He exalts the righteous works. As for those who scheme evil works, they incur severe retribution. The scheming of such people is destined to fail. Now there's numerous of these contrasting pairs in the Quran where God is giving us such extreme scenarios of two individuals who are linked together in some way, but showing how their results, their outcomes, their actions are so drastically different from one another. And I want to emphasize another one in the Quran, and this has to do with Moses. When Moses fled Egypt with the children of Israel, and God drowned Pharaoh and his troops, what did Moses do? We read in Surah 20 verse 83 is that Moses rushed to God. And God asked Moses, it says, why did you rush away from your people, O Moses? He said, so this is Moses' response, is, they are close behind me. I have rushed to you, my Lord, that you may be pleased. While Moses rushed to God in order to make God happy, so God would be pleased with him, what did the children of Israel do, and specifically the Sumerian? What did they rush towards? In Surah 20, verse 85, God informs Moses. It says, He said, We have put your people to the test after you left, but the Sumerian misled them. Moses returned to his people angry and disappointed, saying, O oh, my people, did your Lord not promise you a good promise? Could you not wait? Did you want to incur wrath from your Lord? Is this why you broke your agreement with me? Moses is calling out his people. Keep in mind, Moses rushed to God. In this time period, 
that Moses hustled to make it to try to please God. The children of Israel, led by the Sumerian, rushed to do what? It reads in Surah 20, verse 87, they said, We did not break our agreement with you on purpose, but we were loaded down with jewelry and decided to throw our loads in. This is what the Sumerians suggested. He produced for them a sculpted calf, complete with a calf sound. They said, This is your God, the God of Moses. Thus he forgot. While Moses rushed to God, the children of Israel, led by the Sumerian, rushed to create a golden calf to worship, to set up a partner next to God of something of such ridiculous status of a golden calf, complete with calf sounds, that they were willing to forego God, Lord of the universe, for this object that they created with their own hands, with the blessings that God has given them. Now what's interesting is that the Arabic word for rush, when Moses rushed to God, is ajal. And the word for the calf, as in the golden calf that they created, is ijal. It's the same root for both words. But one God used to show us the contrast of those who are rushing for God, for the cause of God, while those are rushing for the cause of idol worship. One is rushing to try to get a spot in heaven, while the other one is rushing to get a spot in the lowest pit of hell. And again, it's these two contrasting pairs, these two individuals who shared this common story that were really able to appreciate how two people who are behaving the same, but one is doing it in the cause of God, that's rushing to, again, please God, while the other one is rushing to distance themselves from God and secure a spot in the bottom pit of hell. Now I want to have one last example of two contrasting pairs, again, individuals who are joined together and show the difference in how they behave, how one is going to be elevated to have a place next to God while the other one is going to be at the bottom pit of hell. When God created Adam and he asked all the angels to fall prostrate, all of them did except for one, Iblis. Iblis, Satan, said he's not going to prostrate. And rather than repent when called out, when God asked him, why would you not prostrate? Have you become arrogant? Rather than admitting their fault, what was Satan's response? He said, I'm better than he. You created me from fire. You created him from mud. And he doubled down. Rather than conceding, that he, he, he was out of line, that he made a mistake, seeking God's repentance. What did he do? He wanted to prove God wrong. He says, grant me a respite and I will seek all these descendants and show God that they're truly unappreciative. And God granted him this. Now, what happened when Satan went after Adam and Eve? When Satan went after Adam and Eve, he caused them to slip. God gave Adam and Eve one rule, do not approach this one tree. But Satan duped them and convinced them that, oh, the reason you're not to approach this tree is because you'll grant immortality if you do. And they bought into that narrative. Now, what was Adam's response when he realized that he messed up, when he realized that he broke this one commandment that God gave to him? Did he double down? Did he go and curse God? Did he go and say, I'm going to prove you wrong? No, he repented and sought God's mercy. And because of that, God bestowed upon Adam certain words to redeem himself. Now you have two people. Satan was Adam's gin companion. While Satan is going to be in the bottom pit of hell for defying God, Adam is going to be redeemed. Both of them stepped out of line. Both of them defied the direct commandment of God. But one of them repented. One of them acknowledged their faults and chose to go down the right path to fix the errors of their ways. While the other one, Satan, doubled down and is going to spend all of eternity in hell to try to prove a point because their ego has grown so enormous 
that despite the repercussions of their actions, rather than admitting they were wrong, rather than seeking God's mercy, they sought to go to the lowest pit of hell. And again, it's these contrasting pairs that God provides us, two individuals who have this connection that God is showing us. One of them is going to make it to the highest heaven, while the other one is going to fall to the lowest pit of hell. And these are the extreme situations that God has presented to us throughout the Quran to show us these contrasting pairs, the path to heaven and to hell. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at QuranTalk at gmail.com. If you want to follow along the verses of the Quran and understand the word-by-word -word Arabic of the Quran, please download the Quran Study app on the iOS App Store. And if you like the podcast, please share it with other people. Leave us a review. And until next time, peace and God bless.